Determining what is different is quite easy. Customer, uh, companies already do this in terms of customer segmentation and stuff like that. So we don't think that, necessarily speaking, this is a big part of the debate in terms of determining what is a different part of the political spectrum. Um, we're going to avoid three arguments. Firstly, that there's an informative benefit. Secondly, that there's a persuasive benefit. And thirdly, that there's an impact on the media and in advertising and incentives on behalf of both advertisers and the media. Firstly, that it's informative. Um, the vast majority of people in the world don't have a strong opinion on the vast majority of issues in the world. That is to say that the average person probably doesn't have that much to say or think about the vast majority of issues out there that can be discussed. What determines the user's interest on social media is not necessarily a strong political conviction or that they strongly believe in something, but rather what they are moderately interested in. What do I mean by this? Like, for example, if I am the average American, my news feed will be inclined towards local news and not so much stuff in the Middle East. This doesn't mean that I don't care at all about what happens in the Middle East or I have a strong hatred of Middle Easterners. It just means that, in general, my interests are not inclined towards news about that part of the world. Therefore, a benefit about changing the algorithm is just that people with insular news preferences and insular news interests are made aware that there are things happening elsewhere in the world and they might go on to take stances on these issues that might be beneficial or at least add to the public debate about these issues, which on the whole we think is beneficial because it means public enfranchisement. Like for example, I might have no idea that there's a wildfire in the Amazon and having this appear constantly on my Facebook page, but under this algorithm will actually increase my ability to think and engage with this issue. Even if they are made aware of it, in the past, like even if people vaguely know that there's fire in the Amazon or there's conflict in the Middle East or the Arab Spring or something like that, at least seeing this on their feet will remind them that it is happening and makes them think about it. In psychological terms, just forcing someone to confront the issue and make them think about it could spur change on the comparative. So we think that at least there are more people knowing about these issues. Clearly, this argument is not about people with political perspectives and strong opinions about these issues already. This is just purely a claim about information and the fact that most people, in general, have very insular news interests and insular preferences that are catered to by algorithms that encourage this kind of segmentation and echo chamber. So we think that at the very least, we can claim that there is more information, even if we don't persuade anyone to change their political opinions. And we think that more public debate about this is necessarily important, especially because the most vocal people in public debate, currently, especially in first world countries, are those with very strong patriotic preferences against immigrants and against people from other countries. So this is purely an informative thing that we think is important in terms of political enfranchisement as well as in terms of just general education, like making people aware of things elsewhere in the world. But secondly, obviously this is not the interesting argument. The interesting argument is about persuasive benefit, right? Like you think this will make people change their minds and stuff like that. Um, we did put to you that there's a huge problem in closing the, in, in crossing the aisle between uh, like different political perspectives in today's world. Like the fact that, for example, um, conservatives obviously don't understand the liberal position. The fact that liberals might not understand many of the factors that are spurring people and government sure. power, like economic disenfranchisement in the Rust Belt. So there's a need to cross the aisle on these issues and for people to engage with new sources from each other's perspectives. So we think that just at a very basic level, we do this because people are exposed at minimum to different political perspectives and this might make them in some cases reconsider their views. We are not over -claiming. this won't cause a sea change in ideology, but we think that, and yes there will be backlash, but at least a small number of people exposed to contrasting perspectives could have an opportunity to reconsider their perspectives, especially if these were things that were given to them by the community since birth, which they have never had the chance to interrogate seriously. Yes. Yeah, let's say I go on Facebook, and uh, mm -hmm. now because of your new algorithm, like, the whole thing is interspersed with posts about how brown face isn't real as a problem and doesn't exist. Number one, how do you think that will make me feel? Like, number two, perhaps more importantly, how do you think that will make me think? Um, well, it will make you exposed to the idea that people are thinking about this, and you can actually engage with them because many of these news outlets have comment threads and stuff like that. And yes, there will be like vitriolic debates and people will argue, but we think this is a normal part of civic discourse and the political process. So that's, in general, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, if this is hate speech or something like that, then we can censor it. So this, this is outside of the realm of this debate. Um, yeah, so they're not overclaiming. This will not cause a sea change in ideology. And yes, there will be backlash. A, small, a small number of people will be turned off from using social media. But there are a number of responses. Firstly, um, I think that on the whole, people still need to use social media to connect with their family and other constitutive attachments. 
and stuff like that is allowed you that many of these people will stop reading their Facebook feeds entirely. Secondly, if you are really outraged by seeing a contrasting viewpoint, you could just continue scrolling. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are harmed to that large an extent. Um, it is true that many like strong conservative individuals might retreat to echo chambers or other alternatives, but we don't think that this is necessarily worse than the comparative, given that social media for them is presently already an echo chamber, and many of these views are spread. In fact, since they will have less influence if they go to like a random subreddit, um, that might be actually a better idea than if they continue to spread their views on social media. So we think that on the whole, on the comparative, echo chambers will make things like that much worse. Um, also to point out that before the age of social media, most news outlets actually presented contrasting perspectives and there was a stronger incentive to do so. Like for example, commentators do, like, like, um, like Fox News inviting liberal commentators on talk shows for example, just to show like a contrasting viewpoint, even if it was only to debate it and shut it down. Um, we think that in the age of clickbait and social media, all these contrasting perspectives have been lost. And we think that these were actually a normal feature of the news media prior to the age of social media, which means that most people watching these news media was actually, were actually generally okay with it. It's just that it's something that's been lost in terms of social media. So we don't think the backlash is going to be that large. Um, third, the impact on media outlets and advertising and stuff like that. So, introducing a new revenue source for media outlets, i.e. people not interested in the things that they normally report on, um, but removing a base of their loyal supporters that would otherwise have read the article has a huge impact on the incentives of the media company publishing this information. There are a number of outcomes. Um, firstly, media reporting becomes more moderate and headlines will inspire generic interest instead of vitriolic rhetoric pandering to people who already believe in these views. Because the tone of the articles will then become more moderate and more conciliatory since you are pandering to a mixed market of both people who are already subscribed to you as well as people who will be exposed to your information that is a potential source of revenue outside of who your current viewers actually are. So rhetoric will become more middle ground. Secondly, it becomes far more difficult to target things like political advertisements or even commercial advertisements on these news sites because users from all sides of the political spectrum could potentially click on the article because it might appear in their news feed. So you massively change the way advertising is done. Like if I am a political advertisement, it doesn't make economical sense to pay for an ad on a news site but I know that 25% of the people will be completely opposed to what I have to say and might actually do me more harm than good. So we encourage a change both in the tone of news sites as well as both in the tone of political advertising and the targeted political advertisements that are targeted at particular groups of individuals that are segmented by their political views. So yes, we know that people who hold contrasting viewpoints will still be in the minority, but at least the news sites now care about them in terms of the way they write their articles because now they are a potential source of revenue and they have less revenue from their loyal supporters because um, each supporter will view less news sites if they have to view sites from contrasting perspectives. So we're very comfortable with this. Basically, 
that you have a small possibility as a user on their side of knowing that other points of view on the same issue exist. I don't think that makes sense. I don't think it's fair to say that the minute I see an article that differentiates from my opinion for the first time, I'm like, oh, I get it now. I get why they see it that way. Suddenly the opposing stance is completely clear and deliverable to me. That's not true, right, for a few reasons. Firstly, we realize that people articulate a point of view on a contentious issue already know their opponents with their point of view. Because the minute you take a point of view on something, it means you understand it's a contentious issue and you have chosen to take a certain stance on it. The second thing also, right, is often people who look at this, there are also people who cover out Facebook or, or like any social media platform as a safe space for themselves. We're talking about people like say minority groups, right? And often to kind of just continue scrolling as I quote on a PM speech, it's just not good enough for the deliberate destruction of a safe space that they have come and the only safe space they might have when the real world doesn't provide one. But more on that in my substantives, I'll be dealing with three things. The first two points relate to why an echo chamber deliberately created on a social media platform is a really good thing. First substantive, we realize that fulfills the function of social media platforms to develop ideas. We realize that when we show you things that align with your interests, your preferences, and your points of view, it does good things in three ways. Firstly, it allows you to explore articles that give you context for why things are the way they are. If I'm somebody who feels extremely strongly about black facing and brown facing, be it for it or against it, I get context that supports my point of view. This is the unpopular opinion. Say I'm somebody who thought that brown facing in Singapore was perfectly fine. What they will start showing me on Facebook are articles that show me what black facing is and how that's completely different from the brown facing that people are up in arms against. And I think that helps me make a more at least informed opinion of why my stance is the way it is. Also, I get articles that give me actual reasons why my view, why my view is the way it is. In other words, I have a view that I'm better able to substantiate or flesh out. Second reason why ideas are better developed. We realize that it allows better nuancing of your ideas because there's no compulsive need by a user to get really defensive every time a view that disagrees with yours pops out. I don't have to keep guarding against like opponents to my point of view. Therefore, I'm more willing to like read and discuss things that show some concessions on my point of view. Say I'm pro-gun, right? I'll say, oh, okay, fine, I understand that some people may, may misuse it. But if I'm constantly confronted with people who are pro-gun control, I cannot concede that. I have to keep saying, no, no, guns are fine, nobody's going to misuse that whatsoever. At the same time, because everybody has established a basic premise that say, for instance, everyone in this like, echo chamber per se agrees that guns are okay, right? Therefore, we can move on to discussing, no thank you, the mechanisms for guns for like, the usage and sale of guns, for instance. In other words, people can discuss the practical applications of their policies, of their stances, therefore creating for fairer policies with fewer harms of these policies in a moment. We also realize that the third benefit is that it allows you to uh, analogize to other incidents because Facebook will give you articles that, that are like aligned with your stance that show you parallel incidents. And that's great because it gives you more scope and perspective to your issue. So if Arthur is concerned being more informed with the ones that actually allow that. Before I go to my second sub, yes. So is the, claim, is the underlying theme of this argument that liberal ideas are true if you think about them hard enough? No, that's not what I need for What I'm trying to say is that there are people who have liberal stances, people who have conservative stances, and it's better to learn more in depth about why your stance is the way it is, because that creates, one, a better ability to substantiate your stance, and secondly, a more measured take on that stance that allows for better dialogue between liberals and conservatives in real life. Very simple concept. On to my second substantive, on how this will use Facebook's function of building communities. And we must understand that social media is often a common tool for building communities. But the counterfactual that they've created is that social media is now a place for this view. It is not the modern equivalent of a Fox News debate like they claim, right? Instead, it is a mentally unhealthy environment. We are constantly trying to fight battles online to defend your point of view. Moreover, it is made worse by the fact that Facebook is a terrible site for conflict, right? Your social media platforms allow for like short text messages, largely visual impressions. How are you going to create a fight that, that is constructive and not like just emotional and personal and angry? We also realize it's actually bad for my knowledge. Say for instance, your gay teen and conservative community whose only safe space, only of connecting with pro LGBT ideas, yeah. is online and not in a small town. We realize that that is a place for them to find a like minded community. 
How, um, and after these people curate their friend group as far as possible to turn Facebook into a safe space for them. But what you are doing right, is to allow all these social media platforms to actively subvert their efforts to find safety, security, solidarity, and, uh, and belonging. And you are forcing articles that just are, 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 are like aggressive towards their way of life, their basic ideas, their struggle to find themselves down their throat. So they weren't what we see on their sides. All they create is contentious conflict and a great deal of hurt to vulnerable people. We are the ones that allow for more well measured opinions. I'm extremely proud of the post. status quo is where we target content totally to maximize the number of clicks and therefore to maximize the similarity with the information people already have. What we're proposing is not completely overdoing this, but rather having a balance between the stuff that you already know and you want to aggregate and you want to think about with stuff that actually comes from outside your worldview and therefore is divergent and different and interesting for this information. That takes out a lot of the stuff that opening opposition said, because I do not know why you need all of your news feed to be something that is totally something that you agree with to help you consolidate your views and help you substantiate it, rather than having two thirds or half of your news feed on this kind of thing, which gives you a vast majority of the benefit given that people spend hours on Facebook every day, but also giving you knowledge that other things are happening in the world except for the things that you're thinking right about right now. That other people have other views about these issues and in the same way that you have your views about these issues, and it's important for you to be able to engage with those views and think about them. I'm going to talk about first about the things that they say, then talk about whether divergent information really changes opinions, and talk about the con targeting of content in general. On the things that the opposition say, they have a really strange interpretation of the word divergence, which is like that it's politically divergent in the most extreme possible. That is just objectively not what the, the word divergent means. Divergent information is just different information that actually can change the, uh, people's views. It's not necessarily even maximally extreme information. So for instance, if you have one particular nuanced view, a different nuance on that view is also different information. We think that should be prioritized rather than giving you exactly the same nuance. Or rather, you don't need to give people the most extreme version of, it, of a differing view, but rather you can give people views uh, maybe that are like, slightly different to them, which they're more likely to, to think about and be taken. The point is, under status quo, none of this is being done. They're being given exactly the same view, because this is the content that Facebook has realized will give it the most money long term. So this is the thing that we're specifically changing on our side of the house. In response, therefore, they say that to our, they say that polarizing articles are going to get used because they're the most divergent and therefore they're the most prioritized. This is simply false because you can be divergent but, and, and different without like maximizing the difference and therefore uh, be, uh, being advantaged if you have a maximal difference. But also notice that these outlets now gain profits through clicks and they have to gain clicks through catering to the whole internet because now they're going to be given to almost everybody rather than but just a small sub-community and therefore they have the incentive to try and cater to a vast majority of more people, which means that we have much more moderate information. On this stuff about why echo chambers are good, they say that echo chambers let you substantiate your views and therefore you get better nuanced ideas and you like known analogies and all that kind of stuff. This is premise of your view being right in the first place, which for given that a vast majority, like a ton of different views exist, and I don't know, not all of them are right, then that, that, that is that is a simply a false assertion <coughs> that it cannot hold when you think about the whole population in general. This is bad because if you get people to substantiate views and make them stronger and make them better and, and make them much, much more consolidated in their head, but these views are wrong, this destroys the ability of our political system to have political discourse, but also destroys the ability of people to like update their views and know more things and learn more things in the future. This is the point of Arthur's POI. The thing is, you can substantiate your views and think about the, uh, the things behind your views, 
with a certain proportion of your newsfeed being devoted to this, without all of your newsfeed being devoted to this, and this actually lets people think about the fact that their views might be wrong, or think about the fact that their views have to update in reference to other people's views, and therefore let, let them learn a lot more in the long, uh, in the long term. Also, the last piece uh, to this argument is that when do they expect people to actually think about these views in the first place if they're not going to be de debating them or discussing them on places like Facebook, or if they're not going to be exposed to divergent views on Facebook? I do not think it is good for our population to have like, certain distinct subcommunities that never interact with different views because that just destroys the political system as we've had in the past. So therefore, the only alternative is for people to debate in real life. This uh, responds to the point about the uh, argument about communication. Vitriol, uh, real life debate is substantially worse than being exposed to new views for the first time because you're much, uh, much less likely to have time to, and you're to sit back and reflect on it because you see that on your news feed and you're going to be forced immediately to respond to it which means that you're much more likely to be either pushed to certain positions on these issues but also when they talk about communities Notice that the vitriol comes from a small minority, uh, small minority of people. We're talking about exposing people to views that are outside the small minority rather than exposing people to the most extreme views in general, which we think is the most likely iteration of this policy. Finally, finally in response to the POI on things like branding, this is the same with society in general. Stuff that we do not want in society in general, like hate speech, we think is out here. But I think also that it's important to recognize that giving people exposure to uh, like a vast majority of views is not necessarily offensive, but actually just gives them important information with which to make decisions. I'll take closing, if not then. Do you not agree that articles that circulate on social media platforms are different in nature from the factual articles you might get on, say, Wikipedia? Yes, and that is exactly because social media platforms let them cater to tiny proportions of the population, whereas Wikipedia caters to basically everyone who wants to know the basic information about one thing. We think that articles will get much better under us in the house when they can no longer cater to small segments of the population, but they rather have to cater to, vast, uh, to like larger sections of the population in general, because they can't like, rely on the article always being given to this one section of the population because they're given being exposed to other articles, and now the articles are being exposed to a vast majority, like a, a ton of more people, which means that they, uh, they have a much more diversified revenue source. Arthur talked about this, wasn't rebutted. Now, this divergent information change people's opinions? Firstly, we think that factual information is an objective good. When they're like, maybe they're, uh, like factual information also actually uh, applies to people's lives even if they do not think it has uh, applied to their life in the past. So if you're someone in America and you do not, you only read local news, this, uh, like, it's really, really terrible because even though you might not be interested in international news, the thing that you are voting for is actually destroying the country, uh, like the, uh, things internationally in general are therefore extremely important. We think this factual information is generally good, and also often factual information is trusted by both sides of the political spectrum. So for instance, factual information from the US government as an authority is trusted by tons of people, but you can cherry pick currently factual information, and therefore you don't get bad, best exposure to it. But even if this is not true, a few mechanisms by which divergent information can change opinions. A, divergent information can just make people, uh, and if opinions and political articles, etc., can make people change their minds, specifically applied to moderates and swing voters. This is pivotal, uh, these people are pivotal in networks, and they don't generally have fixed extreme opinions right now. So, but if they are given, like, only opinions from one side of the spectrum, then they're going to become more and more extreme. They're going to, like, it's going to be like a self-fulfilling cycle. So, for instance, if I read 55% of my news from this one article, and 40, uh, from this one newspaper, and 45% from the other, Facebook news that knows that don't giving me the newspaper that I 55% of is more likely to get them more clicks in the future, so they'll give it to me more and more. This means I'll click on it more and more, and therefore they'll give it to me more and more in the future. This radicalizes me in the long term because that means it's the only news article that I'm actually reading. B, people who aren't extreme yet, so young people who know, uh, don't get at these extreme views but are in the process of forming them. This is in the long term, everyone we're talking about this debate, these people actually are in the process of making their views formed, and underside opposition will actually get these uh, views formed and extreme under us of the house. They won't. I'm proud to have proposed. Random information. 
solution, right? So we don't care if like I've just never heard of the Amazon rainforest, for example, for some reason, and you want to put it in my Facebook. We think that's okay. We can also tell you why, even if that wants to be your definition of like diversion, why that's not like that's not as good as just allowing you to do whatever you want. But we think that's not the center of this debate, right? We think that's not the important part of this debate. This debate is necessarily about the views that are oppositional to you. And now I want to talk about why within those views that are oppositional to your views, the ones that are going to be sent to you by the algorithm aren't going to be these like moderate, new ones, like long-form discussions that like DP, uh, DPM, uh, DPM like just randomly came up and said like this debate will be about, right? Why? Because those things actually need echo chambers in order to flourish and exist in the first place, right? So you are not going to have moderate long-form discussions when you are not when you cannot even agree on basic premises to, to have that debate on. What does this mean? If I'm a, if I believe in gun rights, for example, and I have to constantly debate like in the comment section of like articles that like you know trigger me about whether or not the Second Amendment is something that I have a right to, we're not going to have a nuanced discussion or like a long-form discussion about like what kind of guns we ought to be using, for example, which districts those guns should be utilized in, for example, how much those guns should be sold for, and who, who, for example, those are not debates that I'll be willing to engage in, and those are not the articles that are going to be marketed to me anyway. So in their world, you're not going to have those like wonderful, moderate, like centrist kind of like things appearing on my side. Instead, you're going to have the simple things that question the basic premises of the of, of the things that I staunchly believe in, for example, right? So you're probably gonna have, and those are the things that get like the most number of clicks and the most amount of marketing anyway, right? So for example, Here's why brown face has been blown up to be, be a bigger issue than it is, for example. And then I'm just bombarded with that on my Facebook, right? How does that in increase or like, you know, make the conversation better for me? Arthur seems to like work on this presumption that I've never heard of this argument in my life before, right? Or that people who, who have like, who believe that brown face is like not that big a deal have never heard the opposite argument before in its simplest premise. This is not true, right? The importance is instead, how can we have a more nuanced understanding of what we are defending on our side of the house? And that can only happen when you're not forced to defend that in an antagonistic manner against someone who is from a completely different camp, Madam Speaker. And that's what they're forcing on their side, right? I think that that's also problematic for reasons that don't have to do with information, right? So, like, they brought up this idea that, like, oh, um, it is about creating the maximum amount of information, right? But who the hell are you as a corporation or as a, as a country, for example? to come and tell me that like as a citizen this is the amount of information that you need to be inputting like you know and, and have access to within social media and disregard completely the fact that social media is often a way in which your political citizenry that they want to talk about so much develops its communities within which to flourish and have its ideas respected and heard in safe spaces right they wanted to talk about citizenry that is not just limited and the, the vibrancy that citizenry, citizenry feels is not just limited to the amount of information they have access to it's limited to the, it also expands and has very much to do with the kind of communities that they have access to and the ideas that are shared within those communities where they can get a reprieve from citizens who are antagonistic to them. Without that, you cannot have the formulation of political expression in whatever way or any opinion or expression, right? You're not going to have that. Instead, you're just going to have like a lowest common denominator argument that constantly occurs again and again. Now, the problem with that lowest common denominator is that it screws over minorities disproportionately as well, right? Number one, it doesn't get anything done. So even your majority, which believes in like, and this may be about anything, right? I don't care if it's about race or gender or about sexuality or whatever. As long as you have an unsympathetic majority, the fact of the matter is that the views get reinforced within that like lowest common denominator debate because there are more of them, right? And at the end of the day, your nuanced views as a minority never get airway and never get time to develop because you are exhausted from having to defend yourself against the nonsense that is coming out from the other side. And we think that that is incredibly problematic. But more important than that, as a minority of whatever stature, when you go online, you want that reprieve that you are getting from that, right? The safe space that you get from that. I think that the other side is incredibly um, unsympathetic to the importance of safe spaces as well as like echo chambers, right? We agree that both these things are excellent things that social media should continue to be, right? Now, why is that then such a disproportionate problem for my friends, right? Aside from the fact that you, like, your information doesn't get to grow, for example, it also means that it is a psychological harm, right? So they mentioned that like, oh, you can just scroll past it, for example. But you have to understand that, or, or like there is a like, report section on Facebook, for example, where offense co uh, offensive content will just be like taken away. But the fact of the matter is that most of the 
problems that minorities face have to do with erasure or trivialization, right? And I'm not just talking about brown here. I'm talking about like belittling like women for believing that like you know men and women are still not treated equally in society, for example. I'm talking about like abortion being treated as a completely abhorrent thing for you to be doing or wanting to engage in, for example. And this means that there is an absolute erasure of the things that you believe in and the ideas that you believe to be important. To deal with that again and again when those ideas are not just abstract ideas or information, hold on, but instead something that is deeply important to you and affects your life is a harm that no corporation or country should be engaging upon its citizenry and particularly its minorities. Yes. If your point is that we want people to use the information that they view on social media and then go out there and debate other people in the real world in some way, isn't the harm roughly the same if you're a minority and you have to confront these people? As well? No. That's exactly where we have a difference, right? So firstly, like, what does this real life conversation look like, right? We presume like um, you like use like more official legitimate channels, or even if you use like state and those channels on social media or whatever, right? We think that the difference on our side is that within those same spaces, you have the development of those like nuanced ideas that we're talking about, right? So for example, what are these ideas, right? Like if we're talking about brown face, right? Uh, I talked about the guns, right? Gun rights earlier, right? You are able to now develop a more complete picture of like why the appropriation of rap for example is not such a bad like problem or why that's legitimate for example or what's that long like legacy that brown face and black face has in Singapore for example all of this that only can happen within that like safe space and echo chamber that you have created for yourself because that's where such important discussions happen because your basic premises are not disputed allows you to form a more complete picture of what you believe in and the particular thing that you are willing to defend then when you have to defend that against an unsympathetic crowd especially a majority, it is easier to do so because you are more well informed. And that doesn't happen on the outside of the house, whether on social media or out of it, because you do not have that space that has been constructed for you, and which is what so, uh, social media has really become. We think that this is an incredibly problematic and frankly condescending motion. So we're happy for it. Confirmational bias. 
what this means is that you're more likely to go and actively research and actively find viewpoints that actually reinforce your current preconceived notions. Right? This means that even if we want to take OO's benefit, that we need to help people to develop their own ideas with context, nuance, whatsoever. But then even in the best case scenario, the marginal, that their benefit is extremely marginal insofar as we tell you that because of confirmational bias, people already have a tendency to do that anyway. I don't know what exactly the utility of social media is with regards to, the, with, with regards to that, right? Therefore, what is our mechanism for that and why do we create a free market and why, why is that free market important, right? How do we exactly create a free market? Given the fact that we have set up the fact, the premise that confirmation bias exists, this means that we need to have this other like conflicting and divergent views to supplement the entire end of the spectrum that you're effectively shutting out, not just because of the fact that you don't engage with people, like, like your social circle tends to not have a lot of people who have, have different views from you, but also because of the status quo, all these algorithms effectively Shut these, up, shut these kind of things up, right? Why therefore is awareness is cause good comparative to even if, to, if, even if I want to buy the entire case from OO. Notice that these are impacts that did not come out in opening government, right? We're going to bring to you three impacts. Number one, I think it's better insofar as we create more like responsible and more informed voting, right? We think it's very difficult for us to engage our general like voting electorate and, and very engage our general populace insofar as we do not give them the entire spectrum of views, right? So we think that we like that the important political implications of why we need to go with government's policy is to create more better a better a better voting and more informed electorate. The second impact of this is that we think we create in you in more empathy and this is good because insofar as we're able to create more social capital for things like social movement, it's easier for us to therefore push for things like like both formal equality, like more rights for women and formal like in, informal inequality, but people realize that they have been like complicit in the system of for instance microaggressions, so on and so forth, right? The last thing I want to talk about with regards to why this course is fundamentally important, not as a random end that OG wants to defend, but this course is important for means of uh, for means towards an end, and so far it's the only way we, that we can allow minorities' voices to be heard, right? Notice the fact that if I'm a more minority, for instance, that I'm a Rohingya refugee, right? It's unlikely that I'm going to be able, be able to ever get any, enough like political pressure and social capital to support my cause because the dominant narrative that exists on social media is not one that's within my favor insofar as I'm not able to have any sort of control over the discourse. So we think it's good insofar as we are able to at least create more empathy for the people who have the least voices, right? Second thing I want to talk about, what exactly is this quality of engagement going to look like, right? Harry's entire speech tells you about why people are going to be very defensive that, and therefore there will be no like long nuanced like discussion that all wants to defend, right? Why are people defensive in the first place? I think there are two core reasons for why this is the case. Number one, they think that the other side does not understand or does not at least try to make an attempt to understand them. Number two, it's because of confirmation, confirmational bias, right? Why therefore are things better on our side, right? Number one, we at least make people question themselves of whether or not their existing views are good or bad. Why is this a good thing, right? Because it's an extremely humbling experience to be able to go on social media and not see things that already reinforce your own idea. So insofar as you're therefore uh, like express the no thank you, you are aware of the other side of the issue. This makes you more, it's a humbling experience insofar as it creates steps for you to become less defensive because now you're at least able to question yourself of whether or not your ideas are true or not. So this is no thank you. This is why we're no thank you. But we're able to get at least less defensive discourse on our side. Second reason why is because a lot of bad, um, a lot of bad discussion that they think will result, the bad discussion stems from the fact that people don't actually have any sort of awareness or any sort of exposure to the other side of the issue. We correct them in so far as now they're no longer able to like like be complicit within the sort of ignorant cycle where like they just like they only understand the other side with regards to the existing stereotypes that already exist. So we think this is a good thing. Last about this whole idea of OO about how we need to help people to identify their own views and it is not a safe, safe space, so on and so forth, right? The first thing I need to say is that some people who like whose views are actively harmful to society just do not deserve safe spaces, right? People who want to like kill Jews, for instance, I don't think they deserve a safe space. So I don't think their kid, I think their kids are incredibly confident. Second thing what I'm gonna tell you therefore is that social media maybe may not be the place where you actually want to build your safe space, right? Because insofar as social media is anonymous, this means that like random bullies can just like camouflage within your safe spaces and bully you from within. I think it's something that's extremely insidious. But more importantly, right, even if you're safe on social media, right, when you actually go out there to reality and you realize that these people exist, when you realize that these people exist, 
who are confronting your idea. We think that for the harm, and, the, the harm may actually go out to reality, but your way from safe space is one that's extremely harmful. For all these reasons, very proud to stand in CG. Where OG and CG tries to suggest. We don't think those things actually work. 
what happens is that evidence of my case will happen and people are often selective of this kind of evidence which means if so if my political skewing won't change the only thing that they have on their side is to, this whole idea of information will be increased and that's why everyone will be like more uh, like more informed right but we think that's a problem solution mismatch if you just change the algorithm just simply because you want this whole thing what we would rather suggest is just like i, I guess photo subscribe to bbc or something like that we think that will also be information uh, information that's granted to them so we don't really see uh, any benefit on their side so if they want to say that political skewing will happen we think political skewing will happen and damage your individual on the ground the only benefit on their side was that this uh, so we think that when, when it comes to cg right what they said was that there's some kind of confirmation bias but they never ever tell you what this leads to what this means when it comes to being empathetic in the first place they just say oh you see and then like i mean i will get empathetic i don't think that's how it works as i, I, I early mentioned to you like how flame wars actually happen in fact you get more disgusted by the views of the other person because they feel have those views in the first place we don't think that will ever synthesize so OG CG out I guess from bad so never mind second argument about identity right now on Facebook we often see different things for example we choose who to follow and choose who to block in the first place the autonomy of this particular information is my identity is aggregation of my identity because users on Facebook um, are not meant to com uh, users on Facebook are not meant to uh, be combative to my own identity in the first place because why why do you think people actually post memes on facebook it's because they don't want facebook to become some dark like like dark history of like information that i don't want to confront in the first place in this particular platform you notice that the only thing that we want to uh, yes so often conservative news outlets already use a caricature of liberal arguments having the extra one won't change anything but at least we change the incentive of the conservative news outlet correct so like my point is if you have more comments and more people confronting in those views people are more likely to use very sketchy and very confusing like lingo lingua franca in order to try to convince other people they really have information overload and we don't think people will be more likely to not be convinced by this kind of thing in the first place we think that as an extension of the meme argument of value I'm making, we think that OG and CG does, um, what OG and CG does is they break the safe space and make it a headache for you to go online, right? When it comes to being a headache on going online, what often happens is you withdraw to traditional media where you either go to exactlyfoxnews.com to look at the media that you want to consume or what, what's worse is you make it harder for people to like digest information when it comes to news and when it comes to information that they want. So when people relegate themselves to traditional media, what often happens is that you have less information, you have more political skewing. So on OG CG, they make it far, far worse on our side. Hopefully we go over like above four. two things in my speech. The first thing I'm going to be doing is breaking this idea of a safe space before I go on to talk about engagement, which should be the bulk of this debate and like further impact the trans arguments, right? So first thing on this idea of a safe space, which was brought up by, um, largely by OO, tried to extend on not by CO, not really successful, I think. So what exactly did they talk about regarding the safe space? When they talked about the safe space, they told us that, well, people deserve the right to be able to feel like their ideas are leg legitimate, they don't feel attacked, and stuff like that. What did Literature tell you? Literature told you a few things, right? First and foremost, she told you that not everyone deserves a safe space. And more importantly than that, she secondly told you that sometimes a safe space is a very delusional thing to imagine in the first place, right? Why is that so? Because just because I don't see opposition to me on social media, it does not mean that I'm a safe person on the streets. Why do we think that's important? We think that in social media is a very good gauge for society, right? At the point where I assume that everyone is going to be accepting of me as an individual, this means I let my guard down. This means I become even more vulnerable to attacks that happen in the real world. That is when I become unsafe, at the point where I let my guard down to the extent that people can hurt me even more, to the extent that I don't understand that there has to be a support group in place because I don't understand that these problems actually still exist. Um, but you disagree. 
given that these people already know you'll be easily hurt in the room, isn't it important for them to have one place online where they will not be hurt by opposing views? Yeah, okay. So first and foremost, no, we don't think that people don't we don't think that people know they're going to be hurt in the real world. Why is that so? Because if all the articles I see are all pro-LGBTQ rights articles, it's very difficult for me as an individual to imagine a world where this is not the bulk of what people think, where this is uh, like where people generally don't think that gays deserve rights, for instance, right? The fact that more Singaporean articles tell me why single like uh, like can tell me that Singapore is a place that is not ready for like same sex marriage and stuff like that is an important way for me to understand that this is the general perception on the ground and therefore this is like this is a country where I'm not seen as a gay individual for example right so therefore we think that these kinds of things are important for people first and foremost so that they don't get bullied because they're so vulnerable individually but secondly so that they recognize that there is a problem within their society and therefore they, they build social uh, like social support groups and social support systems that help them to mutually deal with these kinds of problems. That is why it's important for them to not have these safe space online. But secondly, I don't understand what the unique benefit is of having a safe space online specifically, right? Literally, I already told you why this is, like, the online world of all places is an extremely terrible and malicious world where people can just pretend to be your friend one minute, you meet people anonymously online, and the next thing you know, you get bullied and you don't know what to do because like this was supposed to be your friend, right? You add people into groups that are supposed to be pro-LGBTQ rights move, uh, like movements or, or pages, and yet you have trolls and there uh, or able to attack you at your most vulnerable. I don't think that online space should be one where people can assume themselves to be safe in the first place. That is where a lot of cyber crimes happen, right? So uh, so we think that the safe space idea is something that's irrelevant to the debate as a whole. Um, but uh, so second view on the idea of engagement and how exactly this happens. I think Alvin had a very like yeah, I didn't really understand what the show was talking about, right? What does she mean when you talk about engagement? Why is this unique from OG? We think that we brought you way more like nuanced explanations of how this engagement is going to happen, right? First and foremost, he told you about flame wars and how this is going to happen. Let's recognize that most people don't engage in flame wars, and this is like the bulk of comment, uh, comments within social media, right? We don't see everyone like shouting the effort at each other because that's not the reality, right? Most people go on social media with the idea of engaging. But secondly, and more importantly, you know, thank you. We think that it's important for us to have the opposing view from your social circle for a few reasons, right? On, op like, on opposition as a whole, if their problem is that people are going to be defensive at the point where there is no common premise, we told you in Lincoln's speech why we take that away because we're taking articles from your common friend group, which is to say that oftentimes the kinds of articles that they like are probably going to be things, or like the kinds of ideas that they have are going to be things that are premised on some, some like, common principles that you guys share, and that is why you're friends in the first place, right? So therefore, we think it's not going to be outlandish kinds of ideas that are impossible to buy. But secondly, and more importantly, why is it going to be the case that their claim of people ignoring these articles is not going to be true? We think that this is something that we see generally, like in life, uh, life in general, right? Oftentimes, people assume that they're right, not because they have awesome ideas behind, like, uh, as justifications for why they're correct. Rather, it's because of the fact that they see a lot of people agreeing with them, and therefore they take the convenient route. For example, I've never seen the globe, but I assume that it's, like, round anyway, because that's what the majority of people tell me. We think that people are forced to question their ideas at the point where, first and foremost, they don't recognize that the majority of people buy into those same ideas and that is why we think it's important to have that massive information overload to show you that hey maybe you're not correct what is the impact of this the impact of this is firstly either that you can change your opinions where it's fit or two that at least you are more critical of your own ideas right so even in a world where i don't reject my own original ideas it is still better for me to have a frame of mind where i recognize that i may not always be correct that the majority that i identify with or that i often meet are not necessarily the majority in the entire world which is to say that just because in this group of uh, in this room people may be very very liberal it doesn't mean that the reality is everyone else in the world is liberal and therefore maybe i should question my beliefs regardless of whether or they're right or wrong we think that my that fear of mind alone makes people more critical thinkers and more open to rational discussion as compared to emotionally charged discussions like hey you are stupid and that's why you think that vaccination is a bad thing right therefore we think it's important for us Firstly, to make people question their assumptions generally. But secondly, and more importantly, we tell you that just the fact that you're going to be exposed to these things again and again and again means that you're more likely to feel empathy for them. The other side says, just because I've seen these arguments doesn't mean I'm going to feel empathy for them. The reason why we feel empathy for those people is because when you recognize that a large enough group of people believe in an idea that is opposed to the kind of way that you perceive the world, this makes it more probable that maybe they have a point, right? And therefore, that is when you're more likely to try to listen to what they say. That is why. Um, that is why, for instance, a lot of people who are religious debaters go into debate being religious, but then realizing that maybe they must have empathy for, for atheists, for instance, right? Where they recognize that the bulk of those people within those groups seem to all have a common understanding of the world, and hey, maybe they have a point. Maybe there is a rational reason 
Why are you buying into these kinds of ideas? That is how you build empathy when you recognize that the other side is not just being stupid and ignorant, but rather may have a point, and maybe it's better if you understand those points so that you have a more nuanced discussion, right? And that was the second part of the interest speech that the other side didn't want to deal with. That at the point at which I'm allowed to stay in my own echo chambers, it is more convenient to be, for me to believe that the reason why people don't agree with me is just because they're stupid rather than because they have some sort of proper reason as to why it is that they think that way, right? And therefore, the kind of responses I get are going to be far more defensive because I don't think that there is any text needed to, uh, to deal with an argument that has no value in the first place. It is only when I've dealt with, with article after article of nuanced explanation for why a particular person thinks a particular way that I'm going to understand that one, these are people just like me who deserve respect in the way that I deal with them, and two, therefore, I'm going to have more empathy in the way that I deal with them, and they are less likely to engage in flame wars at the point where I respect your ideas and treat them as ideas that deserve respect and proper discourse as compared to just for guarantees, right? Okay, therefore, we think that the world that we're going to build is one where even if letting people don't change their minds, they're more critical of the way that they think and more able to recognize that maybe they may be wrong and therefore open to discourse. And true and more importantly, we deal with people empathetically and that's why they're more open to changing their mind. So proud to be close. Conservative individual. 
individual who is bigoted. They never explain why this individual doesn't have the right to not want to listen to these other viewpoints. In real life now, if you are walking on the street, would, this indiv- would they force this person to go to attend gay rallies or force them to like, read specific newspapers or watch certain television shows? That's not true. Absent from social media, outside the sphere of social media, we get to choose the newspapers we want to read. We get to choose the television shows that we want to watch. We get to choose the people and the viewpoints that we want to interact with. I am not sure why this choice does not exist when we enter the sphere of social media. Because we recognize that the things that you are exposed yourself to, right, the, the viewpoints that you expose yourself to, the people that you interact with, form foundations of your identity that are intimate towards you. And maybe we should have some ability to regulate the things that we want to see. No thanks, I'll take you um, later. Let's talk about why this is an ineffective platform. I think Yao Kun gave you many points, and I'm going to flag out five things for you. The first is that he said that these people are unlikely to click in the first place, which means that they're going to scroll through, which means that you don't get informative benefit, or you don't get a heightened amount of awareness. But secondly, he also suggests to you that when you start seeing a flux, an influx of opposing viewpoints, that's when you start being defensive in your own view because you feel like you're being under question. This means that when people start doubling down and cementing on their views even more, because they start feeling like the opposing view is questioning their identity. Thirdly, he tells you that when you view an opposing lens, you're not viewing it through a neutral, pla- a, a neutral lens, right? When you're viewing an opposing opinion, you're not viewing it through a neutral lens. You're viewing it through the lens of your own bias, which means that you're going to pick out the worst parts of the articles and focus on those things because of the very confirmation bias that Ling Chuan talks about. But more importantly, and this was something that OO mentions, is that you lose the safe space for these individuals to interact. But even if you don't buy all of these points, recognize that Yao Kun told you about information overload. When you're constantly being bombarded with different variations and different conceptions of the world, this is where individuals on the ground, people like you and me, people who are not debating, and maybe not very intellectual cannot make sense of all the information that's being provided. When you have cognitive dissonance because of all the different information that's being provided to you, you're going to double down and default to the pre-existing biases that you already have. The upshot of this is that government bench does not get any effectual change. Before I move on, yes, closing. Assuming that everyone demands the right to be able to vote, do you think they really deserve the right to be able to be apathetic and as your side characterized, use the bulk of their time on social media, which is a lot of time, to just have fun? I think the underlying premise here is that somehow individuals have a duty to cross this out. But more importantly, individuals have a duty to themselves. The duty for them to feel safe in the spheres that they use. A duty for them to be exposed to things that they like and sources that they trust. It is not fair for these individuals to say that you are forced to view this news site because I'm placing a value judgment that Fox News is not very, um, is very biased in nature and therefore you also need to view CNN. Lastly, let's talk about dealing with the absolute worst case coming from CG, right? They say that this is also a breeding ground for people who are bigoted, people who are anti, like, anti-Semitic Semitic in nature. The first thing I want to note here is that a lot of these conversations where these things fester happen in private groups, right? Private Facebook groups or within conversations within, within one another. But if they don't have Facebook and they don't have Instagram, it's not as if these people will disappear off the face of the earth. They go to more secluded spaces in society where you cannot regulate their viewpoints. This means that no, you don't eradicate these people. No, these people don't suddenly gain some form of empathy and start loving LGBTQ or start loving Jews. But what's more likely to happen is they are more antagonistic towards these groups of individuals in the first place. What is likely to happen in the world of Proposition, opposition in terms of dealing with people who are bigoted in nature. The, the point here is that the moral arc of society does not have to be accelerated by social media corporations. We are perfectly fine with dragging it out. We are perfectly fine with things like discourse happening, slowly waiting for the people who are bigoted to literally die and then more liberal young people come. Because you cannot rush what is right and what is wrong in nature. If you really listen to the language coming from the government bench, there's a presumption here that all people who are conservative are wrong and they need to have these liberal viewpoints in, injected into their social media feed. But that's never the way which human morality is shaped. At a point in which we allow for the art to bend naturally, we allow people to keep these opinions to themselves, things that are very intimate towards their identity, I think CEO takes the first.